freaking first cut. Golly. Welcome to the First Cut Podcast. I'm Rick Gaiman, and this is your Waste Management Open Mega, dare I say, Super Preview Pod. And joining me to break it all down, Greg Ducharme is here. Greg, what up? What's going on? I'm, I'm excited. Another week, uh, Waste Management Phoenix Open is, a, is always a great week. So uh, good to have the gang back together, and uh, let's get it going. The coach is on the road. Coach, good to see you. Where are you at? Well, I'm actually in Florida. I'm doing the PGA Tour live uh, broadcast of the Waste Management. So I really feel like with my preparation, I'm tuned in. I'm locked and ready to go. However, however, I said if Greg can pick a winner last last week, then I'm going to follow him in every sense of the word. So I decided to dress like him today too. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, we've man. got a couple of well, we've got man. a couple of twins. Which reminds me, uh, <laughs> if you're not watching on YouTube, we are very close to 2,000 subscribers. Started at zero, so pretty good. Go over, like, and subscribe to us on YouTube so that you can see all of this in its glory. And rounding out the foursome for today, I think I have vamped long enough for him. It is Kyle Porter. KP, can you hear me? Uh, I can. Sorry, I lost okay. audio there for a second. Are we? Are we? Um, are we here to talk about Patrick Reed some more, or have we moved on from that? Uh, we can go at it. Let's let's slug it out one more time. Let's go. I can't. I can't handle it. I can't do it. There needs to be some sort of. There needs to be a prop bet. We've got all these Super Bowl prop bets this weekend. There needs to be one on how many times he's mentioned. Uh, if he's mentioned more than the Super Bowl on the broadcast this week. Man. Now, now, let me let me jump in real quick because I think that I've set a record this week, guys. Because I I just started another podcast, and the company that sponsors us just launched last week, and Patrick Reed has already blocked them in the first eight days. So I think that's a record. Join I think the club. It's a record. We're already blocked. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Well, that that is a growing club, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, before we jump into the storylines for this week, there is a little football game going on in Florida this weekend. It's the biggest sporting spectacle of the year, and we know that everyone loves making their picks, no matter if you're a diehard fan or just tuning in for the big game. So we think you'll also love this opportunity. Enter the CBS Sports Football Props game for your chance to compete for the one million dollar jackpot that's right one million dollars if you correctly answer all of the questions and a guaranteed fifty thousand doll hairs to the winner and you can win all that money without risking anything football props is free to play just visit cbssports.com slash props or download the cbs sports app to enter Woo. coach what would you spend a million dollars on well, um, I don't know because I'm not allowed to enter this. I do. I will do a quick plug, though, because me and my early edge crew, we're going to be part of a special fee, a special watch party for the Super Bowl, and we're going to be talking about all the gambling prop bets in the game as we do it. I think it's going to be pretty cool. I'm excited to be a part of it. So uh, if people want to watch an alternative to the network telecast, they can watch us. I love it. Also, um, I cannot wait for uh, we're, we're going to talk about the props and stuff later. But Greg, sometimes this week we get the props that are like Rory's final round score versus Tyreek Hill receiving yards, which, you know, that always just gets me all fired up. Yeah, I, I, look, those are those, I like to I consider myself uh, in the know in golf. Right. I have an idea. I can make a logical prediction with a little bit of reasoning behind it. We start combining golf and football. I get out over my skis a little bit. So I personally, <laughs> I stay away from there a little bit. I think coach is your guy for those kind of bets. Uh, all right. Well, we'll, we'll see. I haven't seen any of those yet, but I know we're going to get them come, come Saturday evening and into Sunday, uh, storylines for this week and KP, we're going to start here with you because the USGA, the RNA, they are taking the next steps in the distance discussion. One that has certainly, uh, controlled a lot of the oxygen over the last year or so by zeroing in on essentially local rules and equipment testing measures. So, for those of us who are uninitiated, KP, this is uh, now furthering down the road of it, it, have we gone too far with distance? Are these guys just bombing and gouging their ways around golf courses and essentially proposing, I guess, what could end up being local rules where different courses, different venues have the opportunity to choose the rules? Am I understanding this correctly? Yeah, it's it's Greg might be better on this than I am in terms of like the specific 
rules. To me, it doesn't seem like there was a lot of stuff that was concrete proposed on right. whatever day this is, Tuesday. Essentially, I think the the highlight is Bryson might not be able to use 48 inch driver at the Masters or potentially any other tournament, which is funny because I was he so his first column he writes now apparently his first column for golf.com came out today and Wait, he hold on. Said, Bryson Bryson writes yeah managing editor or not managing but special contributor or whatever okay I really didn't know that. Uh, I didn't know that yeah either. so golf.com he's he's got a byline it's unbelievable he's okay so what did, he, what did he write about what did he write about so he said the 48 inch driver is not working yet but it will at some point in 2021 and then I read this on the same day from the USGA and it's like, ah, it might not actually like that is something that is probably not going to happen. But I thought the most interesting thing was a quote from Mike Davis. And this is on GolfDigest.com, uh, a story by who wrote it, uh, Mike St Statura. So they're, uh, kind of rules person over there. As a quote from Mike Davis, CEO of the USGA, outgoing CEO of the USGA, he said, this is about the long term and making the game more sustainable and more enjoyable. This isn't about hurting golfers. This isn't uh, about necessarily lessening their distance. But the data, this is a big thing, the data is irrefutable. We have a problem and we've got to solve for it. I would almost go so far as to say that for those who don't think we have a problem, I would either say they haven't read the data or they have some personal conflict of interest. When you look at this data, it's so crystal clear that something needs to get done. And to me, that is going to be that quote right there is is the North Star for the USGA and RNA in the future. Whether you agree with it or not, I think that quote is sort of the direction that they're headed in. And how that plays out, I think, is still very much up in the air. Again, it's more research. It's more, gather, you know, it's more time spent on this. But to me, that is clearly the direction that both organizations are going in now, which will affect the game for the next 100 or 200 years, potentially. What I think, um, you know, most people want to avoid, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong here, is a specific set of equipment for the pros and a specific set of equipment for the rest of the general public. And coach, when I start reading uh, about the ability to add in local rules, whether that's by course, but I don't know how they would divide this up. Uh, I imagine a lot of the courses are going to band together and have the same local rules. And if it does ban 48 inch drivers and now 46 is the max, and maybe they do some, something with the ball, I think by the time this is all said and done, you are essentially going to have equipment for pros and equipment for the general playing population. Well, I think there's a lot of people that feel like that's the way it is already right now because it does seem like the game that the pros play that we watch every single week when they're shooting 20 to 25 under par, it's, it's, which is a game that none of us can relate to. And then we're going out and we're trying to figure out what the hell's going on. I, I will say this because certainly I would step back and let Greg and Kyle – who are much more knowledgeable about this kind of thing than I am or would even claim to be. But I, I will say this, that at some point when whatever data, whatever numbers are out there, you just look at the golf tournaments and there's only a handful every year that I really feel like it could be an 80 or a 65. And that's how, as a fan, how I look at it. And if we're going to have golf tournaments that week in, week out, our 20, 23, 25, 27 under, and, and, and we're trying to compare it to ourselves, then I, I would just say that, that this would be a step in the right direction to, to bring the pros back and at least make them look like normal players. And again, that may be a very naive, uh, simplistic way to look at it, but I'm all for this if it can make the game a little bit more difficult for the pros and not just uh, uh, pitch and putt courses all over the, all over the world. I actually think this is – I don't disagree with any of that. I think this sort of direction is actually more about the golf courses than it is about okay. necessarily the players. So it's about, hey, in 30 years, can we even go to wing foot because the minimum people are hitting it is 340 yards off the tee. That sounds like a ludicrous statement right now, but in 40 years, <laughs> it might sound conservative, you know, but mm -hmm. if it keeps going in that direction. So – to me, it is, it's more about the courses. And I think honestly, like, and I want to hear Greg will be better than 
me and coach on this, so we need to go to him. But <laughs> I think I think the direction that this is going in will actually be a benefit to the tours because it'll make their best players even better. I think I like personally that that seems like when you make things more difficult or you bring things back, I think the guys that are at the top shine even mm -hmm. brighter. I it agree. helps a guy like it helps a guy like Rory win. Somebody like, sorry, Scott Stallings uh, can't hit, you know, like he, Scott Stallings can't miss the middle of the club face because of the way drivers are made. Well, that's the thing that Rory and Adam Scott and all these guys do the very best. And so to me, it'll, it'll, it'll increase that gap from the best guys and, and the, the mediocre guys. Um, well, so Kyle, I agree with that last portion there. It will definitely increase the, the, I think back to a couple of years ago at Pebble beach when we're going there. Um, not this week, but the week after and Ted Potter Jr. Beat Dustin Johnson on the final day. They were in the final group and Ted Potter Jr. Beat Dustin Johnson. I mean, that's not something that happens very often. And if you <laughs> change the distance that the ball goes, hypothetically, if you were to, and I know this isn't what the report talked about, but if you were to roll the ball back, make the ball go shorter, Dustin's advantage over Ted Potter would grow tremendously. And there's a, a little story that I've heard from um, from basketball that I think relates quite nicely here. And there was a time when more and more players in uh, in basketball were able to dunk and more and more people were dunking and the the smartest minds in the game got together and they were having a meeting. Do we raise the rim? Do we what, what kind of things do we change to prevent people from dunking? Because more and more people are, are dunking now. As soon, everybody's going to be able to dunk. And John Wooden waited till basically the end of the meeting. And he said, you know, they asked him, we haven't said anything. What should we do? And he said, you leave it. And eventually you're right. Everyone will be able to dunk. And when everyone can dunk, the game will be the same. It, it will be a great game. It will still be a great game. And I look at the game today, uh, the game of golf today. And I look at it the same way. You are not going to prevent people from growing. You're not going to prevent athletes from joining the game that we're playing basketball, that we're playing football before. You're going to have bigger athletes continue to come into the game. You're going to have guys that learn how to swing the club faster and faster and faster. And you can't stop club head speed. There's nothing you can do to stop it. And so on that note, I think the game's in a great place. And I also, to the, to the point coach made earlier about 25, 27 under relation to par to me, distance and score don't correlate um, directly. I think of a U.S. Open at Aaron Hills that was nearly 8,000 yards and Brooks Kepka shot 16 under. Yet, uh, just a couple years prior, there's a U.S. Open at Marion that's under 7,000 yards and nobody breaks par. One over par one. Another time, another event where over par one was Olympic Club. And Olympic Club, 7,100 yards. A very, very short golf course. Distance and difficulty are often um, put together because they're put together for our games. But that that's not what makes it difficult for the tour pros. It's just, it's not. It's an advantage to be long, but it's not what makes golf courses more difficult, in my opinion. Um, and then there was a, another thing that I wanted to get into, and it, it'll, it'll come to me, but I think Kyle made uh, another point. So Kyle, I looked at you wanted to say something. You go ahead and I'll, I'll see if I can... If it can come to my head. Well, I think I think the dunking thing is it's very it's 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 very interesting. I think it's an I think it's an intriguing point. And essentially you're changing and this is this might be where we disagree, you're changing the necessary skills to play basketball at the highest level. And I think that's a little bit of what's going on right now is at for for professional golf, you're 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 not it can still be great. It still is great. We all still love it, but you're changing to me. You're changing the necessary skills to play professional golf. And if you're Bryson, you're literally trying to eradicate long iron play, anything from three iron to six iron, right? He just, he doesn't even want to carry those clubs essentially. And to me, that is, that's the area of the game that I really love watching. And so maybe that's a preference thing for me, but that's the part of the game that I enjoy watching the most. I think it takes, maybe the most amount of skill hitting a two iron, hitting a three iron, hitting a four iron. And so I just don't, I don't desire for that part of the game to be eradicated. And I think the difference in the dunking analogy is you're, you're not, you're not changing like the shape of the, 
the way courses are played the way you are in golf. Basketball is still played on the same court. It might be played a little bit differently, but in golf, you're, 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 you're changing like the entire architecture of how everything is laid out by being able to drive it 50 yards farther. Um, so I don't know. Th that would be, I think your point is good. That would be kind of what I would say in response to it. Okay. So that brings up it, it, you. It's perfect. Cause it reminded me of my point ab about wing foot. <laughs> you know how much I love wing foot. And yes. if you go play it now, it's, it's great. And it will always be great. It may not always be great for tour players. And I personally don't see a, I don't see a problem with that. I mean, that course was built in the 1920s um, and, and things that are from the 1920s don't have to last forever. And there's no, there's nothing that tells me that what they were doing architecturally in the 1920s is exactly the way that the game was meant to be played. The game was completely different. It's different now. It was different 10 years ago. It was different 20 years ago because the golf ball is traveling. It's, it's so much higher. I mean, bunkers were, they used to put cross bunkers. I mean, genius architects would put cross, or they called them four bunkers at the beginning of a fairway because you had to shape it around it because the ball got six feet off the ground or, or less. <laughs> now the ball is 120 feet off the ground. So bunkers are, uh, are hazards on the ground that are in, in many cases eliminated. Trees are the hazard now of today. They're in the air and they're getting eliminated too. So I, I do think one way you could, make the game more difficult. Um, bring back some of the skills you mentioned, Kyle, about hitting long irons, which brings up another point, but hitting long irons, curving the ball. These are, these are common things people say about distance. The game has changed in multiple ways and apex is a big portion of it. When you can hit it high, you can hit it over bunkers. You can carry it over bunkers. So you don't have to curve it around. Uh, you can hit it over trees. In many cases, you don't have to hit it around. But if you if you place trees properly, let trees grow properly instead of take them out, you can you can bring back some of those elements of curve, because I promise you right now, if you watch me play the game of golf, if you watch some of my students play the game of golf, the golf ball of today still curves plenty. It's just not <laughs> necessary. So the skill is the skill is hitting it straight. You, you can hit it straight. You can hit a singular shot shape. You're not forced to work the ball both ways. But let, let me get lastly to um, to the long iron point. Um, I have a, I was at this kind of a, a showcase a couple of years ago. It was um, like a, a merchandise showcase in New Jersey. And this, there was a, a dealer there who had really old golf stuff, really cool, really old golf stuff. And we had a station there with some of our new clubs. And there was this five iron that we found um, from, it was a hickory shaft five iron and I'm holding it. It says five on the bottom of the club. I'm holding it. This looks like, this looks like a seven iron. And I brought it over and there's a little trick you can do with a piece of paper. If you lay it flat on the ground, you can measure the, the loft of the club based on the angle. You can measure the length. Obviously, that's easy. And it measured out to be the loft and the lie, uh, the loft and the distance, the length of the club was exactly what an eight iron is of today. Hmm. And there, there's a three club difference only in the marking on the bottom of the club. And there's, of course, some science behind what goes into the club. There's some technology and improvements and all that. But the club matched a it was a five iron, which you may consider to be a long iron, maybe something enjoyable to watch. But it had the same characteristics as an eight iron of today. So I wonder if you got rid of numbers on the bottom of clubs and simply had lofts or or something along or like Bryson had names. Would that change the opinion? Because part of me thinks the club that comes into a all that is, is a ticker they put on TV that says, uh, this is a five iron or this is a, this is a wedge and you, you question it, but it's a 43 degree lofted wedge, which was an eight iron back in the day. So I, I wonder how much that really changes. Cause I, I would contend it doesn't really affect anything. Can I keep going, Rick, or do we need to? Yeah, yeah, we can go. Well, well, you can put a bow on this. We'll move on to this. One. Okay. So, so last thing I would say, the last, yeah. Are we talking about Phoenix? Or, yeah. <laughs> By the way, uh, Gary Woodland still hits the ball six feet off the ground, so not much has changed with him. Yeah. Um, the the course thing is interesting because you and, and I don't I don't think I I think you saying like why do we need to go to Wingfoot anymore? You're you're like. I understand where you're coming from. I, I don't think you're saying that from like a, a bad spot. I love Wingfoot. Everybody loves Wingfoot. Yeah, I love it. The The problem is if you can't go to Wingfoot and if eventually you can't go to a place like Augusta National, 
do you just keep building? Like, do you have to just build 10,000 yard courses? Where's the money for that? You get into the situation where it's like, okay, if we use metal bats in major league baseball, do we have to just rebuild 30, 32, how, however many teams there are 30 stadiums because every other, you know, every other batter hit every other uh, at bat is a home run. Yeah. I just, I think you get into this very, like, is the, God, I can't, I feel like I keep going back to freaking Nick Saban. Is this what we want golf to be? When you start going down that path of like, Oh, well, we can't really go to Wingfoot anymore. And and that that's not happening this year or next year or five years from now, but it might eventually happen, you know? And so that's where, yep. I don't know. I think the debate is super interesting. And I think it's, I think that, I think you bring up good points. And I think that there are certainly counterpoints for it um, moving forward. Well, that's why it's and such it's, a hot topic in the game. So there, there are great points on both sides. Certainly something that will uh, we will talk about for a while because this is not a quick change, but there is golf this week in Arizona. And coach, you're going to be in the thick of it. I think it's going to yep. be a little bit weird uh, without seeing, you know, 200,000 fans there at Waste Management, but it's still going to have, I'm sure, a great vibe. And JT is going to make his uh, first start back in the United States after going over to the Middle East, after missing the cut, after uh, taking the week off and, and coming back. I mean, this is this is really a staple event on the PGA Tour. Everybody knows this one. Everybody loves this one. Well, and, and the tours, all the emails I'm getting, all the preparation that we're doing for PGA Tour Live, they're, they're putting a great spin on it. That, you know, normally there's over 200,000 fans every single day, and there's going to be 5,000 every single day this week. It's not going to be the same course. Now, I choose to look at it from a, a positive perspective and say 16 is going to look different. Is it just going to be a wedge? Of course it is. But there's going to be a lot of holes that are used to having uh, stands around them that they're not going to now. How is that going to affect certain drives, drivable, par, whatever, right? But at the same time, I'm also looking at the field. And in years past, you normally don't see a player fly over and play, you know, a 16-hour flight away and then come back and play right away. Well, Rory did it last week. JT uh, has been back for a week now. But then you're seeing the Finau going over there and playing. So uh, I'm interested to see how these players play because I really feel like Rory last week, it affected him. Because I, th I feel like Saturday and Sunday his uh, concentration was off. Uh, his, his, his distance was off. And when you have to quarantine, when you have to take COVID tests, when you have to sit in your hotel room and then go out and try to play a, a golf tournament, that matters. And I'm interested to see how some of these top players who are traveling all over the world having to do the COVID stuff are going to perform at a course that's now very different or will appear visually very different than the Phoenix that we're used to seeing. Uh, yeah, I, and Rory's been very candid about the lack of fans and potentially the lack of energy and having to find those sources of focus and sources of energy in, in other places. I have the featured groups here and, and Greg, I want to ask you which, which, if, if you could only follow, only watch one of these groups, which one would it be? So here are the groups. We got John Rahm, Justin Thomas, Harris English. These are featured groups, of course. Uh, Webb Simpson, Hideki, and Gary Woodland. Those are three past champions. Uh, Brooks Kepka, Ricky Fowler, Si Woo Kim. And then Rory McElroy, Xander Shoffley, and DB Straight Vibe and Daniel Berger. You can only pick wow. one. So I would say the last, first, the first and last are the best. And I'm going to go with the first one with JT and um, JT Rom. And who was the third in that? I mean, Harris, you, you don't even care who the third one is, whoever it is. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> but Harris English is a great ad. I mean, what a great, what a great player to watch. So I, I think the first one is the, is the strongest. So you have the world number two and world number three in the same group. I mean, is it really fair? It's not uh, a fair I'm fight. A, I'm a bit partial to the Rory Xander DB straight vibe. And that is a group. Yeah. yeah. KP nice, right? That's, the one. That's the one right there. That's a good do you, vibe. Do you, do you guys know that the players really hate being on PGA Tour Live? You know, every every I have people ask me all the time, like, how do you pick this group or that group? Why is this guy? Most players hate it because I've every single that. shot, 65 shots, everyone is seeing. Every single shot, because that's what we sell when we do PGA Tour Live. And the one who hates it the most is Phil Mickelson. He despises PGA <laughs> Tour Live. So I think the tour likes to mess with him a little bit. And they put him on every time he plays just about. But uh, it's, 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 it's interesting. It's interesting. Well, I think soon, Coach, everybody's going to be uh, in the same boat. And like we almost had at the players last year, every shot, every hole, 
for every player. Mm -hmm. I, I get used to it because that's coming your way soon, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that is that, that, and the way that obviously Augusta national did it for the masters is right. just unbelievable where you get oh, access. It awesome. to it. It's, yeah. it's absolutely, you watch the tape. I can't wait for that. Oh, uh, it's absolutely bonkers. Um, I'm trying to think what else for this week, gentlemen, before we jump over to, oh, there is, so there is a big time event in Saudi Arabia. This is the third year this event has gone on. Uh, DJ's over there. Kyle, help me out here. Bryson's over there. Bryson. Uh, Tony, see now, see now. Patrick Pat Reed stayed over there. Patrick Reed went over there. This is this is an event that has that has been controversial in the past. This is an event that players have had to make statements on and with their affiliation for it. I've not heard any of that this year. Um, I don't know if <laughs> the, the public sentiment has changed on on those guys going over to the Middle East, but I've not heard a peep about uh, anybody's anybody's going over there and whether we agree or disagree with it. Yeah, I don't, I think Phil's over there too, right? Uh, I'd have to look. He's Pretty gone sure, which, is, which yes. is crazy. He got two million last year. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I'd go. I, <laughs> I don't. Um, I, yeah, it's a good question, and I don't. I don't really. Maybe it's just we're. You know, it it got normalized by like guys continue to go there, and we're just like, well, I guess this is going to be a thing. Maybe. Uh, you know, some of the PGL stuff, you're like, well, you know, if that's, you know, does that play into it at all? I, I, I don't know why there hasn't been. I think I think anytime you do something for the first time or the first couple of times, it's like, whoa. And then if everybody keeps doing it and if guys like DJ, who pretty much everybody likes are doing it, it becomes normalized. I'm not saying that's good. I think that there's a lot about it that's not great. But I just I think that's sort of where we're at with the Saudi event right now. Let me give you a little inside information. Let me jump in real quick because people wonder why so many of the top players go and why it's different. So three years ago, uh, everybody knows I've been in the WWE for a long time on and off. So they announced that they were going to do a bunch of shows over there. It was a 10-year deal. There's a prince who is the, the son of the, the ruler of Saudi Arabia. And he is, for lack of a better term, he likes to he's, – he's like the kid at the club. You know, that, that gets the VIP table and he pays for it as long as you get the stars to come over to your table. That's who this guy is. He, this is who he is. And so when they signed this deal, the first show, they said, we want Hulk Hogan. And they're like, well, Hulk Hogan doesn't work for us. He goes, we'll pay him $2 million to come over here and be part of the show because I want to be around Hulk Hogan. This is all true. And so Hulk Hogan got $2 million for traveling for a week. And they've got this, this hotel over there. It's basically a Ritz-Carlton, but it used to be a big – uh, like palace and everything's gold and it's phenomenal. They don't care if they make money on this. It's about trying to show the world that this is a country that now welcomes people. They want it to be a travel destination. And I guarantee you, there's not one of the players that we've mentioned that's making less than $500,000 to show up. And most are making seven figures because this one prince who runs the show and he's in charge of everything entertainment for this company or for this country rather that, the WWE still is in the middle of that deal. And every time they go over, it's a different legend that goes and makes seven figures to show up because this one dude likes to hang out with stars. So if you've got a chance to make a million dollars for one week and take a little bit of backlash, I'd be okay with it. I'd love to know what everybody's number is. Everybody's got I a would number. Too. I would too. I would too. Like, but it's like at least Rory, half a million. Rory's number. Is, well, I just mean like, what's the number where you're like, okay, I'm in. Oh God! Yeah, R God. Rory's number is a lot higher than Jason Kokrak's number. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, Jason Kokrak is in the field this week, so that's well, why I saw that. I was like, oh, well, okay. it, but it's an interesting discussion because you know Abu Dhabi and Dubai are not paying the same amount for appearance fees that this prince is because the country's paying an entire country. Imagine the United States paying <laughs> to have these stars come over and play. That's essentially what it is, and well, so and that's, and that's where it's it, it becomes problematic right when you've got this government that is oppressive it's not great yeah. it's a bad situation yeah and then all of a sudden you're taking money from them to promote them essentially to promote the the, the government you know like the the people that are running the show it's just it's messy you know it's a it's a mess um but everybody does have a number i mean 100 percent. you just yeah. do Every well, house is, is for why, sale, as they say. Yeah, every house is for sale. And that is why, like, uh, some of the comments I see is like, oh, don't politicize this. Well, it's like, 
uh, okay, well, the government is li- like, how, how are you not going to, right? Like the government is literally has their hand in it. So it's kind of hard to separate the two. I think yeah. we're, yeah. It's 2021. I think we're post politics. Like I think I think every, I think everything is political. Like I I don't I don't know why that that uh, that veil is is gone. That thing's dropped. It's over. Um. So just to wrap out the or round out some of the some of the names. So I have the list here. It's DJ Bryson, Reed, Hatton, Finau, Hovland, Fleetwood, Answer, Casey, Sergio. I mean, it is a it's a pretty stout list. And yes, Phil Mickelson, Greg, at a hundred to one. If you are interested, below Ryan Fox and Thomas Dietrich to win the Saudi International. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna uh, save your bucks on that one. Yeah, but it's interesting that Phil's number is at. Just this two, I mean, two million is an extremely high number if that's it. I don't know if it is or not, but oh, but for Phil Mickelson, it is. is it? I mean, what what difference? Because he's does he's that the Hulk make? Hogan, he's the Hulk Hogan of it, it's it's not about yeah, Phil showing up for the fans. This is about one dude, yeah, one dude. Very, I'm telling you, fascinating, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, gentlemen, we've got to get to our super contest. Our, our betting picks are one and done leans, but first, we're going to take a quick break and hear a word from our partners. And we're back. All right, super contest. So let me give a quick update here. Our best bets have been doing pretty well. We are 10 and 7. So what we've been doing is we've been listing out all of our bets. We've been designating one of them as our best bet. Of course, Greg, you hit a big, it wasn't your best bet, but you had a Patrick Reed ticket last week that jumped you up in the standings quite a bit. So we are actually going to start with Greg's betting card. So... Producer Jacob is going to bring that up here, and I'm going to get it rocking and rolling here. So, Greg, um, I'll, I'm just going to read through this, and then you can tell me your best bet and some of the things that are uh, most interesting to you. So, here we go. Greg's betting card. First of all, he leads off with a, a playoff at three to one. Playoffs three to one for the last five editions of this event have gone to a playoff. He rounds it with. Two top 20s, one on Henrik Norlander, one on Rory Sabatini. Two top 10s, one on Webb Simpson, your defending champion, one on DB Straight Vibe and Daniel Berger. And then two outrights to win a Weber, Webb Simpson, and a Justin Thomas ticket. Greg, how does that sound, and what do you like the most? Um, well, I like the uh, the playoff. Playoff? I, I, <laughs> I, I don't, that's, that is not the best bet, but it is four out of the last five years. And I was looking at it, and I said, you know, it's kind of fun. Um and let's see if it happens again. It'll give you something to root for no matter what happens the rest of the way. So that's kind of a, just a fun one. The rest of them are a little more serious. So uh, Henrik Norlander, uh, he is my best bet, top 20 at plus 350. Um, and I put 20 units on him. Reason being, he checks both boxes for me and the odds are are great. I mean, um, plus 350 for a top 20, I think is pretty solid, especially when you consider his recent form. It's a, he's coming off a top 12 and a T2. My analysis of this event says recent form and iron play are the two most important things. And Hedrick Norlander's iron play has been great. He's inside the top 40 strokes gain approach. He's hitting over 74% of his greens in regulation. Also seems to be um, a common theme for winners here is they do very well um, with their iron play. So he checks all the boxes and I think the number is great. So I love Norlander um, in that spot. And Justin Thomas and Webb Simpson are two other guys you see a lot of on my mm-hmm. card. And they, they check those boxes as well. They're both playing well. JT is there's a there's a question a bigger question mark next to JT than Webb Simpson. But Webb Simpson's come kind of quietly coming off a, a T4 at the Sony Open and last year was one of the better iron players on tour uh in the game. Part of the reason why he won, he was second strokes gain approach last uh in this event last year. So I think you're going to see Webb play well again. He Webb Simpson has courses that he plays well on and he always does. Every time he goes there and this is one of them. So I love Webb here. Um, and Daniel Berger checks both those boxes too. So, I, I mean, after the playoff, I'm really co- quite confident on all of those. Um, the, the, the winning tickets, you're obviously not going to hit both of them, but I think all of these guys are set to have really strong weeks. Henrik Norlander was second in strokes gained T to green last week. Also, uh, Webb Simpson's T four 
at Wiley was like the worst T4. Like the guy should have yeah. won by seven shots. Like that yeah. was the worst like he could have ever have played and finished fourth. He's unbelievable. And producer Jacob, we're gonna flip over to my betting card next because uh, I have a lot of strong parallels with you, Greg. So I figured that was a nice a nice segue. You and I can talk through this a little a little bit yeah. here because I'm also a big believer in Webb Simpson and Daniel Berger. I've got outrights on both of them. Uh, we've we've said this a lot about Webb Simpson. Once they step off the tee box, he's basically the best player in the world and he kind of showed that uh last year at uh waste management it sparked one of his one of his two wins and then of course uh obviously in, in great form coming in but greg i, I want to get your thoughts on this because i've opted to allocate a lot of my funds uh via matchups so i went justin thomas over john rom the only chance you get jt at plus 110 best iron player in the world i'm gonna take it i took sung jm over harris english and i took siwoo kim over gary woodland so i i've i've taken a large chunk greg of my bank Role for this week and tried to get it in some safer matchups and then just sprinkled my outrights. Yeah, I like the outrights that you have. I think they have a, a real a real chance of coming through. Um, as when I look at your matchups, the interesting one, one I I I wish maybe I put a little more thought into Sung J M over Harris English. Harris English coming off a terrible, terrible first round at the farmers, which brings up some questions. Is he injured? And, and Sung J M has been playing pretty well. I, I wouldn't maybe not great, but I mean, he played, he was, he was actually pretty good last week. So Sung JM well, playing last, great and a great iron player. Yeah. He played so I, I think week. that's, I mean, that's almost, I'm surprised that one's not highlighted. JT over Rom is tough. It's just, it's tough to bet against John Rom. I love sure. betting for Justin Thomas, but I mean, who you have to, you got to beat John Rom. That's uh, <laughs> man. <laughs> I just, I'm ask. not crazy about that, but so I, yeah, but I, if, I might if, have highlighted him over English, but um, if but you yeah, think that great. they're if you think they're equivalent, then you're getting you know you're getting a good number there for JT. Yeah, and I, good yeah. point. Uh, I don't know. I think Rom's we, probably better, but who knows? We we should probably go to my card next, based off of this card. <laughs> we are we are going to go to your card next. So I'm I've got Justin Thomas. That Justin Thomas over John Rom bet. That is my best bet. I also have a Sam Burns to win ticket because this guy is a nut who in his in four of his last six rounds he's been like the best player on the earth. The other two, he's been yes. the worst player on tour. So uh, I like the volatility. We're going to see. He was in the final group last week before yep. imploding, but like Sam Burns is hanging. I got him at 70 to one. He Brett four had, putted the first hole last yeah, week. He, How do you was do out that? Of it. I don't yes. know where we were. It might've been on HQ where we were like, Patrick Reed is getting no push from Carlos Ortiz or Sam Burns. Ortiz implodes and burns right away. Four putts the first <laughs> hole and Reed is feeling no pressure from his group mates. Like it's sometimes it's that can bring it down though. That could take sure. the energy right out of a group. So yeah. it's interesting. I don't yeah. think anything brings Patty Reed down. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah. If adversity, he is he uh, in the dark. The That's right. All right. We're going to coach's betting card. So coach has a couple of matchups here. He has Ryan Palmer over yep. Ricky Fowler. He has the opposite of what I have, which is John Rahm over Justin Thomas. He took Will Zalatoris, which I love in a top 20. He took Hideki as top Asian. He took Rom as top Euro and then a Rom Hideki double chance. And if he wasn't, if that wasn't good enough, coach, you sprinkled a little Bryson to win in Saudi Arabia. Talk me through your card. Well, the, the Saudi bet was in homage to uh, KP. I just wanted to make sure he knew I respect him and how he goes about it. So I threw a little uh, Saudi bet in there for you, Kyle. Uh, Wait till you see uh, Kyle's card. Okay. <laughs> and, and anytime, anytime I can get John Rom, it's kind of the opposite uh, thought process that you guys have on JT. I think Rom, anytime you can get a less than minus 140 or 150, I'm, I'm going to take that, especially over, over a tournament. And Hideki, he's won here in 16 and 17. I think last week was kind of an aberration. And so when I get plus money and all he has to do is beat whatever is eight to 10 Asian players and then Rom, you're getting plus money on him. If I think he's going to win, then why wouldn't I think he's going to be the top European player too? And it's also, I don't think Justin Thomas is going to play very well. Even though he was third here, T3 last year, I think with the trip, I think, and I don't know if you guys saw this today, but he put out on Twitter, hey, I've really had a lot of personal growth. I'm back in the States. He's still thinking about it. It's still in his head because he's tweeting about it. And I think that he, he's going to struggle a little bit. He missed the cut overseas. And so to me, that was a great number. And I'm like you, uh, Rick. I see a lot of value in February. Um that it's a grind, and I want to get some points on the board by picking matchups. And also, yeah. um, 
I, I like fading him. I did not like your M pick because only he and Rowinski are the two players that have not missed a tournament since the start of 2021. I know we make a big deal about him playing a lot. At some point, you got to get tired. At some point, you got to get tired. And I think this week is the week for Sun JM. I would agree with you if his name was not Sung J.M. And if he's trying to play every <laughs> yeah. single week, he, he's looking for games in the middle he's of the week. He's trying to find something. Yeah, he's out there I looking know, for things. I know. Uh, Coach, I, so just to, just to be clear, that that Rom top Euro, that is your best bet. I also love yeah. this. The, the Will Zalator is top 20. You know, we, he's, we've got a small sample size on him, Coach, but the mm-hmm. sample size that we have, oh, my God. If he continues this, he is something really special. And, and I don't think that we're going to see plus money next to him or plus units next to him uh, for very much longer when it comes to top 20 or or higher. I think that this will probably if, – if he gets a top 20 this week, it's probably going to be the last week for a really long time that you're going to see Zalatoris in a top 20 pick with, with plus money. He, he's starting to be that good. He's that consistent. And uh, Kyle loves to say that being – what do you say? Consistently inconsistent – that's not what Will Zalatoris is. He, he's been very, very, very consistent. And as long as I'm getting plus money, I'm going to ride him and, and see what happens. All right. Um, strap in because we yeah. are heading over. <laughs> <much time today. laughs> we Just a second. I'm going to go time. take a nap and I'll be back. <laughs> We've carved out some time. So if you guys have been following, uh, we've kind of been poking Kyle every week. You know, he starts with five bets, then he moves it up to seven, he moves it up to nine. We're like, Kyle, you're just going to increase your bets every week. Yep, because Kyle Porter has 15 bets on the card. So producer Jacob, producer Jacob wasn't even going to type these out. So we're showing the graphic right now, and I'm going to I'm going to go a column at a time KP and then and then we okay. can talk about these. So, okay. uh, on, on your left hand column I see a couple of or four top 20 finishes. So those are Will Zalatoris, Sam Burns, Luke List and Keegan Bradley and then you back it up with a Sam Burns to win tournament group D on William Hill at four and a half to 1. So clearly you're in on Zalatoris, clearly you're in on Burns. Talk me through this column. Yeah, Burns is the main guy. I mean, I I I feel like what he's done over the last three months has kind of flown. I mean, he's been unbelievable from T to green uh, since, I don't know, November. I think he's been second to JT in this field from T to green. Um, and then a bunch of these guys, Luke List, Keegan, hitting the ball great. Just, I mean, Keegan's losing three strokes around with his putter over the last two <laughs> month or two. I mean, it's, yeah. it's a, it, it's like almost like, honestly, like I think I could lose fewer strokes with like, if you, if I putted Keegan's, T to green shots, I think I would lose fewer than three strokes around. So you. that's huh? actually a great. That would be so fun to see. Actually, pinch putt. It's called pinch putting. Oh, I'm like, not, like I'm, a pinch hitter. Yeah. Oh yes, yes. I think I could lose. I could lose fewer than three strokes, right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I want to say no because you're not a professional golfer, but that's so many, and I know how bad he is. I think you might be able to. It's, it's since December one, it's three point two five strokes per round. Granted, that's only three uh, laser rounds, so I might be that might be just a bad number for him. If you had Keegan staring you down with those eyes, <laughs> and, and you better make you. I'm, you better I'm presuming it, that he's walking to the next tee box. <laughs> okay, uh, so he's, he's not going to stick no, around. No added pressure. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, okay. Second column here. So two top 10 finishes, Rory McIlroy, Xander Shoffley. I know those guys, you have a double chance. So this means either Justin Thomas or Rory McIlroy to win. You get that at five to one. Then you took an outright on Rory at 11 and an outright on Xander at 11. So you are piling up on studs to do what studs do. Yeah. I, by the way, the funny part about this funny <laughs> pr- producer Jacob probably doesn't think it's funny is every Not week. Bad. I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to make three bets this week. That's it. <laughs> and, and then 45 minutes later, I'm like, what, what am I doing? segment to become I, exactly. <laughs> uh, I love Rory this week. He um, he's driving it. Uh, I've got his numbers right here. Let's see. The last month, he is of the players in this field. He is basically second behind JT from T to Green. So he's been hitting the ball great. He's been putting all right. I think I just I don't know the this course. Um, according to Data Golf, it it helps him more than anybody else in the field. And I feel like he's going to have a big week. I feel like Xander's kind of flying in under the radar. You know, he's mm-hmm. never finished worse than I think T seventeen here. 
coming off a great week at a place where he doesn't normally play that well. And I just, I don't know. I think he's going to, I think he's going to be, I think he's going to win. Like he's going to be my pick to win. The Xander thing's really interesting because he just th- that was the backiest of door T twos last week where he like didn't play well at all and then he he finishes T two in a group of a bunch of others so it like was even more under the radar than if he just finished T two or whatever like it, I I agree with you it was a very quiet just methodical grind for him to play well at a place he has not played well at which I thought was impressive. Yep. Yeah. Uh, your third column here. So we get into uh, a couple of matchups and three balls here. So you've got a Ricky Fowler three ball over Sung J and Bubba. You have a Sung J three ball over. No, sorry. A Sung J matchup over Harris English. A Oh, man, we all took this one. Justin Thomas over John Rahm. So that's two to one, coach. We've got you out. Ah, okay. And then I see a JT top five ticket and then another double chance this time with Rom or Webb <laughs> to win. That gets you four and a half to one. Um, you got a lot of guys here who could, who I, could I don't, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Kyle, Kyle I, have a, I have a quick question, Kyle. Yes. Um, you do realize there's only five guys can finish in the top five, correct? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I have the lowest percentage of like if everything is perfectly. Like, I'm still only going to win 50 percent of my. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you might as well just bet, you might as well bet exact results like one through five. This yeah. this this scream yeah uh, this screams of a tournament in which I just love the top five guys in this tournament, and that's that's normally true, but. In terms of like past history here, in terms of current trends, I just I think Webb, Rom, JT, and Rory and Xander I think are going to be unbelievable this week. I just, I, I, I do don't too. know. And maybe, I do too. It, maybe that's just you know maybe you could say that every week, but I feel it more this week because I feel like everything's kind of converging on perfect place for them, playing great, all these different things, uh, and so that's why you see their names littered all over the board. I I. Uh, I'm glad I have – whenever I saw the Harris English over, or the Sung Jay over Harris on your card, Rick, I was like, man, I hope I have that one. Well, I have everything, so of course I have that one. <laughs> you do have that um, one. Okay, now out of these 15, pick one to be your best bet. I'm going to uh, I'm gonna go Sam Burns top 20. I love that. Okay, That's so good. Sam Burns good. top 20 is Kyle's best bet. Okay. Good job, gentlemen. We got through that. Now we are going to move along to one and duns. And I'm pulling up the standings just so that we have it here. So Kyle and I made a bit of a move last week. We are nipping at the heels of Greg and Mark, who both missed the cut. Coach, you've got some work to do, but I think you are going to figure it out this week. You're going to have plenty of eyes on this tournament, and you have essentially every golfer available to you outside of Xander, Henley, Straka, and Hideki. Where do you think you're going? If you just told somebody that those are the first four picks in any one and done tournament anywhere in the world, they'd be like, "Who in the world is picking those guys in a row?" <laughs> but, but they, there was a method to the madness. I, I said this week I'm going to go with who I believe is going to win, and even if he doesn't win, and I'm probably going to double up on somebody here, but I think John Rahm is going to cash, and even if he doesn't win, I think he's going to at least get a half a million or more. Oh, sweet! Okay, so I could still really gain some ground if Rom has a has a really good week and if he wins. Um, I, wow. I, Kyle, you know I love you so much. Respect. I hate Ricky this week. I just don't think his game's good enough. But he, he could. He shows up here all the time. He, he he very well could make me look like an idiot and 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 show up and win because he, well, he loves what, this tournament. I'll, I'll just jump into this, Rick. I think what's interesting sure. about Ricky is he he's a great putter. Right. And he's been putting terribly. If you look at his last couple of months, it's really the swings kind of come around a little bit. I mean, compared Mm -hmm. to 2020, it looks, you know, he looks like Ben Hogan, but uh, (laughs) it's the putter. And so I'm curious to see if he gets off the Poana, gets back to a place like Phoenix, where obviously he's comfortable. You know, does it? And I don't know. I might not end up going with him, but that was just kind of one that popped out to where I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to use him the rest of the year. Maybe I should use him at a place where he's won. He's had a ton of success and he's kind of hitting the ball pretty well. That's a good theory. That's a good theory. So yeah, these are our leans and uh, the four of us have all different leans. So what coach was getting at is uh, we can definitely make some, make up some ground on one another because we're not just, you know, riding each other's coattails here. Uh, Greg, you've, you have the guy that 
I, I wish I could take, right? I've already, I've already used him, but you, you need some dollars here, man. So you get, you get Dustin Johnson at Augusta and in the six events since you have cashed for a total, a total, my friend of 168,000, you need web to inject some cash into your account. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> I'm like, just it, just dragging right now with the one, the pit, it, it is such a drag. And last year, uh, it was so I, I was the complete opposite. And in my, in my chase to victory last year, I was constantly, I had to throw that in there. I was just constantly, I I was, uh, <laughs> that was the latest victory lap we've ever yeah. had. Like six months just, later, just chip it away every week. I just, it was a solid top. It felt like a top 20 every week. And I was just chipped away, chipped away. This has been the boomer bust. So I need an injection, as you said, Rick, and Webb Simpson. To me, there are two events where he's a must play and Mark loves him at Wyndham. I right now I can't wait that long. I can't wait for, <laughs> for Webb at Wyndham. I need to I need to catch him now. So I'm going with Webb. He checks all the boxes. It's gonna be a great week for him. You're like uh you're like Robin Hood. You need cash like literally right now. <laughs> eight, I, I, I could just call eight seven uh what is it, eight seven seven cash now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's good. All right. My, my lean. So unfortunately, um, I've used Decky. I've used burger. I've used web. I've used Xander. I got a million bucks for Xander though. So that, that was okay. Uh, but I'm in the midst of a pretty good one. I've got 800,000 over the course of the last three weeks. I look at this and I say, if you're going to use Bubba, which I think I'm probably going to have to, you want to get them on a Bubba track. And KP, this isn't this isn't one of the Bubba tracks, right? It's not Riviera. It's not TPC River Highlands. It's not Augusta. But I'm not going to use them at Augusta. I can play somebody else at TPC River Highlands. And for uh, not winning here, he's had a hell of a run. I think it's a Bubba week. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. What did he... He didn't do much last week, did he? No, he missed the cut, but he gained strokes off the tee in the one round that he played. That's Dude, the only bet yeah. I won. That's the only I I had him to miss the cut last week. It was the only bet oh, I won. I think. There you go. I think, yeah. I think he missed the cut at at was that his first tournament last week mm, of the I year? I think it was. Mm. I think yeah, I don't. Good. I don't. Uh, I don't love it. I don't hate it, but I don't. I don't love it. Uh, what are you saving Rory for? In my defense, I don't love it either. I'm kind of like I would have loved to have used <laughs> Web here, right? Um, you don't you don't feel burned if Bubba misses the cut. If you if you miss a cut on Bubba, it's not the end of the world. I will so say our that. problem that's one is, thing I like. That's true. The problem, KP, is we we started this at Safeway. I used Rory at Augusta, so now I uh, can't. I'm I'm done with Rory. So. What about I'm kind of, uh, I'm gonna pick why, why not take just like a like a, like a Sam Burns or like a you know because there's a million of those guys and they're Ryan gonna Palmer. be fine. Yeah, you I took, took Ryan Palmer. Palmer last week. Yeah, I took him last week. So I, I'm Sun just Jet? trying to go. Sun Jet? Yeah, I did. I got I used him two weeks ago. I got 137,000 for him. Probably, I've probably used I've like used <laughs> <laughs> Look, yeah, this try to help him. I try to help him out. This is process of elimination. We're, we are. This is our seventeenth week. I, so I've gone through seven, sixteen golfers, and I've located the gas. It's on the right, and I've pushed it down since the start, and I've not stopped yet. I can't. I can't it's, wait it's, to see. I can't wait to see Henrik Norlander come across my text tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow <afternoon. laughs> I, I I will say this. I I feel like a NASCAR driver. Speaking of hitting the gas, I feel you know in NASCAR now they only have so many. Uh, tires that you can use in a race and then if you get to the end you're just kind of screwed i feel like i'm gonna have tires left at the end of my race <laughs> and you guys are gonna be like oh I, got, I can only put gas in the car i've got no tires left that's how it feels right now and we're only in february oh uh, yeah want, you know be... the one good thing about that uh about about having no tire you have enough sample size to know that you know billy horschel's been playing well and he may be a play at Wyndham. like you you know you yeah. have some not if you're scrapping early and you've only seen guys who've played once uh since january it's it's tough to feel confident about them but later in the year there are some sleepers that you've seen a sample size you know how they're playing you have a better feel for the season we'll see how it plays out Real quick, Rick, do you like when you're looking at this stuff? Do you like the guy who um, has had great form over the last couple of months, but not, might not be as accomplished generally, like a Sam Burns or somebody like um, I, I don't know? JT is a bad example because he's always great, but somebody who 
has kind of maybe not been great for a month, but you know their baseline is really high. Like, which one of those guys do you like better? Uh, yeah, I I like the guys who have shown it. I, the the Sam Burns types are usually the the ones that I lean towards, just because, and especially how they're doing it. Right, if you're if they've gained six strokes putting every week for three rounds, and that's how they get their top ten, like that's a crash and burn situation. But generally speaking, if I can get guys playing well from tee to green in the moment, as opposed to their baseline, I'd prefer that. As as opposed to trying to like time when so and so pops back right. up. Yeah, right. it's, that, I think it's a lot more difficult to, and a lot, a lot of guys don't foreshadow it. Like Hideki does not foreshadow it at all, uh, which is right. tough. Some, some guys do some guys you can see, you can see it kind of coming, but it's, it's yeah. a lot harder. I think. Yeah. Gentlemen, uh, that is going to do it. If you want to make sure you get our expert picks, that's sleepers, that's top tens, that's pick to win. Uh, those go out on Twitter and Instagram. So give us a follow there at first cut pod it's waste management week it is a superb week we will be checking out everything coaches on the scene you can follow coach on twitter at the coach rules that's kind of uh, real quick you can follow. real quick yes, please real please, quick please. don't want to interrupt you real quick uh we'll have uh golf picks tomorrow on the early edge and by the way if people aren't playing with us right now we've won seven of eight days in a row and i'm looking at the scores we're two and oh to start tonight and we got 10 <laughs> picks on the board tonight just a little, little shameless plug for another one of our great podcasts that is killing it. That's I love it. it. I'll be on there Thank tomorrow. You. See you. Yes, see you one more. Uh, Kyle it. Porter, who you can find at Kyle Porter CBS. KP, plug something. Uh, I've I've made a couple of uh, Old Testament jokes on Twitter today, so go check it out. <laughs> how, how have they gone? Uh, well, it's a, it's a very niche market, uh, Old Testament idea. golf crossover. But the people who get it, they they seem to enjoy them. There was a time you used to kind of test run tweets in like the group chat. See how they see how they'd be like well received in the group chat. Then if they were well received, you tweet them out. That's a good strategy, I think. Gives you yeah, gives you a level. I, I, yeah. It's it's just you know the Seinfeld. You're just creating material and then you roll it out there to the broader audience. If if it <laughs> if it goes well, I don't know. I don't even know what I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> I, I, like more, I, I, see, I I got some more bets to make. <laughs> yeah, get back, get back to William Hill uh, at Kyle Porter CBS if you want those Old Testament takes and Greg Ducharme at the real GFD. Greg, has there ever been a fake GFD? Uh, yeah, it was a huge problem back in the <laughs> early nineties. <laughs> Heads the real GFD. So uh, follow me there. Follow him. <laughs> follow him on Twitter. All right, <laughs> yep, it's really me. <laughs> Producer Jacob behind the glass. Thank you very much. You can find me at Rick Run Good. This has been the first cut, and we'll catch you next time.